morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. Oh, this is a very special day, a very tender day. You know, there, there's an interesting little poem that talks about that birth date that, that uh, we have and also the date that we pass on, that the dash in between that represents our entire life. And it seems uh, kind of interesting, that small dash in the two large dates. But you know that, that life is so extremely important to us. We use some different things to represent how important it is for the people that have been in our lives and continue to be in our lives in spirit form. And we uh, have this interesting struggle that we have between this world and the next. So we, we go through an All Saints Day like today to help bring some comfort and some peace and try to bring some understanding to, to what we do. So welcome to this place. Glad that you are here. Some of you are guests. This is your first time at Trinity on the Hill. We're glad that you are here and just ask for you to uh, find the welcome folder. It's on every pew. If you'll sign in for us, we'd appreciate that very much. Let's worship our sovereign God. This morning, our call to worship is found in your bulletin, Psalm 16. This begins the procession of the honoring of the saints triumphant. As you're able, let us stand as we read responsibly. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to decay in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Let us join with a triumphal hymn for all the saints, number 711, as we process into the glory of God.
be seated. Today we come together to honor those who have died in the faith in this last 12 months. This is a tradition that was begun back in the 4th century in a little city called Antioch where the followers of Christ were first called Christians. It was their intent to honor those who had been killed because of their faith, their witness, their service to Christ. Through the centuries, though, the church has opened that up to recognize all those in Christ who had passed away, whether they had suffered for their cause or not. And they set a date called All Saints Day, November the 1st, which is Wednesday of this year. And then the preparations that were made for the service were always done on Hallowed Eve. Hallowed Eve. Now you know why it gets its name. And so we come today to speak the names and to honor those who lived among us in faith and died in that faith. As I read the names out, we would ask you to stand for those that are in your family or that you were friends with or honored their ministry. When we finish the list, I will ask for anyone whose family members who had died in Christ in this last 12 months to stand. And then after that, I'll ask us all to stand. As we remember, there are still people who are being killed for their witness, even in the United States, through the deaths of those in the church in South Carolina, as well as the church in Tennessee. Ben T. Lockett. David E. Ingstrom. Aaron Marshall Bongard. Donald O. Lundquist. Eugenia Bergamy Colcock. Elizabeth Betty Guy. Dorothy Freeman Dukes. Warren D. Evans. Desi Landrum Kolke. Thomas L. Ayers. Susan Kaufman Licata. David James Falls. Dorothy Haney Murray Hare. Marvin Gooden. Carol D. Steinberg. Lillian Missy Jones Joyner. Wendell O. Ushery. Andrew Ogden Paul. Lieutenant Colonel Stanley Albert Schrader. Florence B. Carter. Stephen Allen Hill. Karen Lisa Walsh. Please stand if any members of your family or friendships has passed away in this last year in Christ. Let us all stand as we honor the deaths of those who have died in the service of the kingdom of Christ. 
Let us pray. Lord, we do give you thanks for all your saints, for those whose faith was tested and found to be certain and sure. We thank you for those whose saints have suffered because of their commitment to you and did not waver even in adversity. But Lord, we also thank you for your saints who, even though they were not required to suffer for you, nevertheless served you in quiet faithfulness, steadfastly clinging to you and your way. Holy God, we give you thanks for all the saints, the great, the not so great, the courageous, the faithful, the bold ones, and even the timid ones who loved you each in their own time and place, thus showing us the way to eternal life. And we pray this in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. In the Apostles' Creed, toward the end, we have the affirmations of All Saints Day as we believe in the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. With the faith of the saints in mind, let us now respond with our own pledge of the Apostles' Creed and our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated as we go into our morning prayer. Quite often the prayer of these saints that we have just uh, honored was, Lord, I need you. Uh, I can visualize many of them kneeling at this altar. They had their spots. And um, so with that in mind, I want to open this kneeler to anyone who would like to come. Spend some time on your knees as we go into our morning prayer. Lord, I need you. loving Heavenly Father and Sovereign Lord, we want to let you know that we are glad you're in control. As hard as that is for us to accept because we want to be, we're glad that you are. You watch over us so marvelously through this life and the hereafter. You help us bridge that gap which seems so deep to us but is shallow to you. And you help us understand in this life just a bit of what hereafter is about. So we thank you for today that leads us to a better understanding of this mystery of, of death and of passing on. And the fact that we really 
don't die. We just go to somewhere else. Our spirit form lives on. It's hard to even find the words, oh God, to describe it. For you tell us there is nothing here in this world that can even compare to what is there. So teach us again once more about all of this so that we can be strong disciples here in this world where we practice, so that we can be greater witnesses when we walk out these doors, so that we can be stronger citizens as we pray for those who govern us and who lead us, that they make wise decisions and proper decisions, quarrel less and love more. Lord, as we think about this place and where we worship and all that's going on around the world, we're grateful for those, our public servants around us locally and around the world that, that take care of us so that we can worship in this form, so that we can be here freely. We ask that you bless them and strengthen them, keep them, protect them, let them know that we love them, keep them out of harm's way, help bring quick resolution to those conflicts that are so, so unnecessary. And teach us what we can do in this little corner of the world to bring peace. Lord, we thank you for one another, the body of believers, as we are gathered in this place and strengthened by one another. And as we represent each other when we leave this place, that you will again open up your spirit to us in marvelous, marvelous ways this morning. As we remember those so dear to us, let us gather from their characteristics and from their gifts and their talents, incorporate them through Christ's love in us that we can reach out to one another and, and continue to lift one another up. We realize many that cannot be here today because of sickness or, or other reasons, and we just pray that you bless them. Many who are watching by television, and we ask that you hold them up and let them know of your love and your presence right where they are. Direct our hearts toward you in all that we do, for we are constantly grateful for your love. As we are in this place and we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And Number 723, Shall We Gather at the River, one of our great American hymns. Uh, many of us have grown up singing this, and sometimes we sing it kind of slow and sad. Well, we're not going to do that. We're going to sing it. We're going to move along, sing it like a march. Let's stand as we sing.
that chorus, just the chorus, without the instruments. A lot of you sing parts, so pick a part. The choir's going to sing out in parts. Here we go. Yes, we'll gather at the the audition to join the choir <laughs> every Wednesday night. Uh, first of all, it's parenting in the pew today, but children are going to come down now as you greet each other in the name of Christ. You know, as I stand here understanding the representation of these roses, and I realize how magnificent our life is to Christ. You know, we were born into this world. It's a world of sin, and we have a lot to deal with, especially through confessing where we are wrong and the like. But God is so quick to forgive us. Jesus loves us so much that we can never, ever understand completely that love. We want you to know that through this broadcast, that our life here is important to Christ. And I hope you feel that love and understand how much He loves you. And God bless you as you watch today. May it be a blessing in all that you do. Let's go to the kids. Ah, good morning, kids. I've asked Greg to help me this morning. Ooh, right. I'm going to give him a pitcher mm. of water. Thank you. I like this. Great, this good... delicious water. Oh, you need to Come back some. this oh, way. Sorry. Thank you very much. Now, I want you to pretend that he's my daddy and I'm a little kid. <laughs> yeah, I know that sounds funny. Um, he is older than I am, but we're not going to go there. All right. <laughs> pretend he's my dad. And I just love to drink water. So watch this. Dad, can I have some water, please? Certainly, son. Thank you, Dad. Have some water. Oh, this is going to be great. I can't wait to tell. What do you say? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh, this is great. Oh, this is going to be good. Mm. Oh, that is so good. Can I have some more, please? Well, son, after you finish that, you may have oh, more. But man. you need to finish that. Some more. Have yeah, finished that first. Oh, man. Have you ever had that happen to you? <laughs> I guess so. All right, let's try it again. We're going to pretend something else. Greg is going to pretend to be God the Father. And in his picture is grace and love. And he's going to pour me a big old glass of grace and love. Oh, I love grace and love. Oh, let me taste it. Oh, that is so good to taste the grace. Oh, God, can I have some more? You got to finish that first. Oh, man. How am I going to do that? Oh, I got an idea. Here, you take this cup. You take that cup. You take that cup. You take that cup. All right, hold your cup. There we go. Hold on. Yeah, it's wet. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Bruce got the last cup. Ah, I have given you God's love and grace so I can have some more. Mm -hmm. All right. Fill it all. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> it's great. Can I have some? Oh, wait a minute. I know Finish the issue with that. that I have to share it with somebody else, don't I? I get love from God and I have to share it with someone else. That's the secret of being poured out for Christ. So remember that when God is blessing you, he's wanting you to pour it out to other people so that they can be blessed, and then you can go back and get some more. Thanks, Father. <laughs> let's pray. Holy God, thank you for our children. May they always be blessed by you, but let them know that as you pour out blessings on their lives, that they are pouring out blessings to others and how they love people and help people. We pray all this in Jesus' name, and God's children said, Amen. Just leave Amen. your cups right there on the step, and you can go... Back to your parents, because this is Parenting in the Pew Day. Oh, you wanted to drink it. Well, it's good water. It was very good water. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dad. All right. Today, as we um, come together, this is our last Sunday that we'll have photographers in our gathering area for you to have your picture taken. We want to be sure we update all of our pictures in our 
um, digital directory. This is not going to be a printed directory. However, if you'd like a printed part of that, we will absolutely make one for you. It's going to cost you a little money, but it won't be fancy, but it will get you pictures. So make sure you, uh, after the service, go to the um, gathering area and have your pictures taken there. Uh, this will be our last Sunday. Um, as we also come to our time of offering and we remember the saints, we are standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. Their generosity have brought us to this point where we can do so many things in ministry and programs and in missions. Because of their generosity, we can continue to be generous in offering our gifts to God, knowing that Christ will be advanced all over this world. So we invite our ushers to come forward as we pray together. Holy God, we thank you for the example of the saints. Now may we be an example following their example of generosity as we give our gifts and our lives poured out for this community and across the world. Amen.
conceded as um, Lisa moves to the piano. We're going to have four hands going over at this piano. And the first time I heard an arrangement, this arrangement of this great old American hymn, um, it just totally captured me. Uh, I hope you feel the same way. The words are right there in the bulletin if you would like to follow. It has a great history. It came from England. It ended up in South Carolina. A man by the name of William Walker wrote a, another tune and added this great refrain, I am bound for the promised land, and it became one of America's favorite hymns. Amen. Yeah. Makes you want to get on the bus and go. <laughs> Maybe not. Today our scripture reading is from the second letter to Timothy. This is from Paul. This is probably the last letter he wrote that we have at least uh, recorded. And so a lot of scholars have called this Paul's last will and testament particularly in the fourth chapter, in the sixth to the eighth verse, which we'll read this morning, are, are very much uh, words written with death being a short distance away. So, let us stand as we honor the reading of God's holy word as you're able. Paul speaking to his protege, Timothy. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let us now trust the Holy Spirit to awaken our curiosity, to inspire our understanding, to transform our behavior in the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. One of the great joys of doing ministry is at Christmas time going to those who are homebound and serving Christmas communion. We read through the Christmas story and we have that Christmas communion. At Trinity, that joy is doubled because I get to go with Reverend Greg Hatfield, who keeps, his, uh, keeps a finger on the pulse of all of our folks who are homebound. Uh, I noticed when we first went out that his practice was after communion was over, he never emptied the cup until he got outside. When we got outside, he would find a, a place of grass or a place of pine straw, and he would pour out the cup in the shape of a cross, and he would say a prayer of blessing upon the family in the house. He did that every single time, and it's such a blessing. It's the pouring out of the communion juice in front of the house for a blessing. In a similar way, we're talking about Paul being poured out as a drink offering, a drink offering. Now, that's part of the sacrificial system. And the people that uh, Paul is writing to would probably understand this if they were Jewish Christians as a reference to the Old Testament sacrificial system, or even before the sacrificial system, really. Because in Genesis chapter 35, Jacob has an experience with God. He calls the place Bethel, the house of God. And as he builds up a little pile of stones, or maybe probably a big pile of stones, he consecrates it by pouring over it a drink offering, it's called, uh, probably some wine. Later on in Exodus, as they are shaping up how the sacrifices will be made throughout the seasons of the year, one of the things they are directed to do after the daily sacrifice for sin, they are to take a hen of wine and pour it upon the sacrifice. Anybody know what a hen of wine is? H-I-N. It's a gallon and a half of wine. We're not talking a smidgen here. We're not talking a cup. We're talking a gallon and a half. I don't even think they sell that at Walmart, do they? A gallon and a half of wine. They were serious about making this drink offering as, a, as at the end of that sacrifice, the animal sacrifice, showing their thanksgiving to God. Now, there were a lot of Christians, though, who read Paul's letters who were not Jewish. They wouldn't understand that. But even in their pagan background, there was a practice of pouring out a drink offering. Pagan religions would have people take uh, the glass of wine, and at the end of the supper or the end of the worship service, it would be poured out as a drink offering, a way to say thanks to sacrifice of their God. Uh, some even say that they started not pouring the whole cup, but just a little smidgen, a little tide, you know. We want to keep the best for ourselves, right? So whichever way these Christians were seeing it, they understood what Paul was trying to say about his own life being poured out as a drink offering. That his life was not being wasted for his own personal use, but it was being poured out for the use of the worship and the service of God. So I think that we can look at Paul and say that we too should be pouring out our lives as a drink offering. We need to be emptying out our lives. Now, keep your mind in Timothy because I'm going to move you back to the letter of Philippians. Philippians was written years before, um, not too many years, but several years before Timothy was written. Paul was in jail in Rome. It wasn't his last time in jail because he would get out and do some more ministry before being thrown back into jail. And he was writing to the church in Philippi in chapter 2. He quotes what is known as kind of an ancient hymn of Christ. In other words, the early church was singing this. We don't know the tune, but they, it was good words. And in chapter 2, he talks about that we should imitate Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to our own advantage, but rather Christ made himself nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The Greek word that we translate made himself nothing is kenosis. And it means something that is emptied out. 
something that contains uh, some kind of liquid or some kind of solids, but then it gets emptied out. Now, there's a lot of deep theological discussions about this kenosis. How did Christ empty himself of his divinity? Uh, don't want to get deep into that. Don't want you to think it's anything to do with the Buddhist practice of emptying themselves either, because that's totally different. But in this part, Jesus is trying, or at least the early Christians are trying to describe Jesus emptying himself out so that he could become the servant of humankind, taking on the very nature of human kindness. And so Jesus needed to empty himself for some reason so that he could be a servant. Now that we understand. Now, what you may not under see is that 10 verses later, same chapter, chapter 2, and verse 17, Paul uses this term of being poured out as a drink offering again. Well, actually, he's using it for the first time because remember, 2 Timothy is his last letter that he writes. And it's interesting that as he uses that phrase, that he is being poured out as a drink offering, it's in relationship to the Christians at Philippi who are offering their own sacrifice and service in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, I am pouring my life out because of the sacrifice and service that you continue to make in your faith. And so we see in that one chapter how they mirrored Christ giving up himself taking on the nature of a servant, even dying on a cross. It means that as we pour ourselves out, we become servants. Now, that's very appropriate because just last week we heard about our volunteer ministry, how we can go online and find places to serve within our own church and across this community and even across the world. It's something to keep in mind that when we pour ourselves out, it's for service. For what are we emptying ourselves? There's two things here I want us to keep in mind. The first one is probably the more obvious, that when we come to Christ, we have to empty ourselves of the sin and the wickedness, the bitterness, the unforgiveness that we, call, that we have in our lives so that then Christ can come and live in us. We would call that repentance, wouldn't we? In most of Paul's writings, he doesn't talk about us emptying ourselves as much as he talks about crucifying ourselves or dying to sin. Much like Jesus said to us, take up your cross and follow me. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, he talks about the Christians. He says, among us Christians, we, everything that's connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls the necessities of life, we must crucify that in ourselves. We must kill it off, if you will. Kill off getting our own way. Kill off mindlessly uh, responding to what everyone else calls necessity. Now that's Eugene Peterson's translation, which is rather long. Normally it's just translated emptying ourselves of our corrupt nature. Killing, uh, crucifying our old selfish feelings and, and the evil things and desires that we want to do. That's sanctifying grace. That's that sanctifying grace we talked about several weeks ago. That as we enter into the house of God, we empty ourselves of self-centeredness, hatred, bitterness, and sin. And we allow ourselves to be filled up with love for others and grace and holiness. So in one sense, we empty ourselves of that which does not suit God so he can then fill our lives with the blessings and the goodness and the holiness of God. But what do you do from then on? Like the children's sermon we just had here, uh, your cup overflows, you know, and there's no room for any more blessings. It's, kind of, you know, it's like the kid who wants more, but the mom says, hey, drink what you've got, then I'll give you some more. In spiritual lives, I see so many people going to so many Bible studies, going to so many Christian concerts, and just filling themselves full of grace, but never expending any spiritual calories. They take, they take, they take, but never give. I'm always reminded of uh, Amy Grant's old song from 1982. Now, we're going back to ancient contemporary music. Can you say that? Ancient contemporary music? <laughs> Amy Grant sang a little song called Fat Little Baby, and it's to the tune of kind of the Andrews Sisters swing music. It's delightful. You need to look it up, and I'm not going to sing it for you, uh, 
But look it up. He talks about how a Christian gets uh, born again, sanctified, redeemed, and has the biggest King James you've ever seen, but never does anything to help anybody else. And all he ever wants, he wants his spiritual milk. Now, the song actually has scriptural reference to it. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. The writer of Hebrews is complaining about the Christians under his care should by now be eating the meat and potatoes of Christian living. But rather, all they can do is ask for more spiritual milk. When are you ever going to grow up? When are you ever going to pour yourself out rather than simply asking for your cup to be filled? It's my belief that we empty ourselves of the blessings which God has given us so he can fill us up with more. It's the part that the children of Israel never understood, that God blessed them, not because they were special. He blessed them so they could bless the world. And when we stop blessing others, we clog up the blessings that God has for us. And he has so many blessings he wants to fill us up with. Uh, You just read through the scriptures and you hear how God wants to fill us up. Now, I'm not talking about prosperity gospel here because most of the references here have nothing to do with our, our, our possessions and our money. It has to do with our spiritual lives. To give you just a few, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge so you can be filled with the fullness of God. Be filled with the fullness of God. And in Philippians chapter 1, he talks about being filled with the fruit of of righteousness. In Romans chapter 15, the God of hope will fill you with joy and peace as you trust him so that the power of the Holy Spirit can just give you abundance of hope. But the one I like the most is from 1 Peter chapter 1. Though you have not seen him, yet you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and is filled with with his glory. Christ is the fullness of God. And when we believe and trust in Christ, when we follow Christ, when we pour ourselves out for Christ, he will fill us. Now back to 2 Timothy, fourth chapter. Paul says, as for me, I am being poured out as a drink offering. You need to back up one verse to verse 5. Because there he's addressing Timothy with the same kind of words. This is especially noteworthy in the New Revised Standard Version. Because verse 6 begins with, As for me, Paul, I am being poured out as a drink offering. Back up to verse 5 and it starts out, As for you. As for me, now as for you, Timothy. Always be sober. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am poured out. He knows the end is near. Time is run out, but he has fought the good fight. He has kept the faith. The crown of righteousness is within his grasp. Now, for all of us, the sense of time running out is always before us, right? How many of you have thought this week or this weekend, how did October suddenly get over? Did anybody think that? Yeah, the older you are, the faster they go, sometimes even by years. One of my favorite reminders, and I keep it on my cell phone, is the kind of a bad news, good news thing. The bad news is time flies. The good news is you're the pilot. You can determine how that time flies. Actually, it should be God is your pilot. You're the co-pilot. Together you determine how that time flies. You don't want to get to the end of your lives and find out that it's been poured out for the wrong things. But the end of your lives will come. I'm always reminded of uh, being babysat by my grandmother, my granny. She liked her soaps, her stories. You remember, is Days of Our Lives still on? Please tell me it's not. Oh, yes, when that show started, it started like this. Like the sands of an hourglass, so are the days of your life. Is it still? I don't know. Anybody know? Nobody's willing to admit this, are they? <laughs> you're, you're very smart. You're very smart. So in a sense, everybody's life is being poured out for something. 
Are you pouring your life out for your job so that on your tombstone you could put, I wish I'd have stayed at the office one more day? Are we pouring out our, our lives for sports or being popular or for something that will not last for eternity? In my mind, we're going to enter heaven only with an empty cup. Now, that's not scriptural. That's just me thinking. Because one of two questions are going to be asked of you when you get there before the judgment seat. We all get to go to the judgment seat, by the way, no matter which direction we go. And perhaps the question will be when God looks at us, he says, let's see what's in your cup. You show him your cup and it's full of bitterness. It's full of unforgiveness. It's full of greed. It's full of, I did it my way. By the way, don't ever select that song for your funeral. <laughs> if you've got that in mind, you just need to think about it some more. I'm afraid if your cup is full of that, judgment day is not going to be a happy day. Or maybe you come before God and he says, let's see what's in your cup. And you show it up and say, look, God, I got every Bible study I've ever attended in there. I've got every blessing that you've given to me, my family. Oh, they're so great. A beautiful church and how wonderful it was to sit and worship Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday. I brought it all up here with me. I think God might tell you, you're not going to get any more until you pour out what you got. Pour out what you got in sacrifice and in service. I think we're all going to get to heaven. We're going to need to have an empty cup. We're going to have an empty cup. There's no chorus that goes, fill my cup, Lord. I lift my cup, Lord. And it, we just get this feeling of being overflowing, right? And there is, there is some sense of that. But it seems to me the song doesn't go far enough. And as we get our cup overflowing with the blessings of Christ, we need to be pouring it out for others. Pouring it out as a drink offering, a sacrifice of life for others in the name of Jesus Christ. A sacrifice of service and helping others to know the great love of Christ. John Wesley understood what it meant to be poured out in life. He wrote a special prayer for a covenant service. Usually we do these covenant services around New Year's Day, New Year's Eve. It's found in your hymn book in page 607. I'll, I'm going to ask you to, to turn in your hymn books to 607. I think Methodists need to know that this is in your hymn book. It's a little hard to find sometimes because you're looking for Wesley's covenant prayer. You just need to stop and look for covenant prayer. 607. And in response to this message, I want us to pray this together out loud. And you're going to see the phrase about halfway through, let me be full, let me be empty. I think it's a prayer in response to this word from Paul. To pour oneself out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service in our church. Let us pray together. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am Thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. This has been the worship service from Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church, a production of Trinity Methodist Television, as an outreach ministry to those of the Augusta area. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738-8822 or writing Trinity on the Hill, 1330 Montesano Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 30904.